the solution to the problem of addiction is to primarily understand where it comes from. So, as we said earlier, nothing is taboo. There's no such thing as a wrong action in life. The difference is whether or not we've questioned the pros and the cons of the activity. So the person who is addicted to something, whether it's a drug or an alcohol or gambling or money or any of these other range of things we can get addicted to, is because we didn't question at the beginning of the activity. We went into it, why? If we didn't question it, then why did we go into the activity? When we make choices, we can make choices based on one of two things. We like it. Either because the intellect has recognized it's the right thing to do, or because I like it. So when we choose something just because I like it, or because one aspect of the mind likes it, what's happening is that we are taking ourselves towards what we call neutralization. So let's just describe this a little bit first. When the mind has an impulse, contact the drug, contact the alcohol, contact the person, contact the casino, contact the pornography, contact the whatever it is that you want. And the problem with technology, it's a double-edged sword. It used to be that if you wanted to contact something, in fact, pornography is a really good example. This is when I was in India about five years ago. I'm sitting on the local train going to Pune. I'm sitting next to a couple of boys, maybe 16, 17 years old, looking on their smartphones. They're bored. It's a 60-minute train ride, so how can you really alleviate the, alleviate the boredom? Click, 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 bang, it's right there. It's immediate. So technology has a whole range of benefits to the human species. It also brings with it other challenges now. So any time the mind has a little impulse, contact, if we don't use the intellect to question, then what do we do? The mind determines the action without any governance of the intellect. And so the moment I have that little thought, that feeling, what about the drug? What about the alcohol? What about that insert object here? The body then follows. This is the life of an animal. The moment an animal experiences a particular emotional impulse, what happens? <laughs> Bang, it expresses through the body as action. No intellect. So nothing is taboo. But if we don't question what am, I, what am I doing and why am I doing it? Where is it going? What's the effect on my personality? Do I need it? Do I need it now? Not now or later? If we're not asking these questions, then what's happening is that we are strengthening the mind's desire for that particular object. And then every time the object is asked for by the mind, we slavishly give it to it. Somebody else is in the driving seat. It's like you're in the back seat of your car having a sleep. And someone opens the, passenger, opens the driver's side door, jumps in, starts the car, and drives off. You're not in control of that vehicle. You have to go where that person decides. This is exactly what happens when we allow the mind to determine our choices. I'm not in control. The mind's impulses are determining where I go now. So this is the first thing that's happening, is that the mind is alone in charge of making the choice. How is that problematic? OK. So this is taken from one of the other texts. The state of neutralization has two aspects. In the first aspect, what happens is we get to a point where we get no further pleasure from the contact. Now, we always use the same example. We've, ever, we've even spoken about it in these sessions before. OK, so in India, last time I was there, living at the Vedanta Academy, for nine months of the year, no mangoes. And then the hot season comes, and the mangoes just burst out onto the trees. The first mango after that period of forced abstinence of nine months, what's it like? Sweet. It's not enough to describe it. Yummy, not enough to describe it. You can't describe it. Yeah, maximum pleasure. 
So you finish the mango, you wipe your mouth, you clean your hands up, get all the juice off. You walk around the corner and five minutes later, one of your friends walks up to you and says, hey, I know what you like. Here, I got you a mango. First mango of the season. And you haven't got the heart, the heart to tell the poor guy, I just had one, you know. So, oh, thanks, mate. I appreciate that. You take it and you eat it. What's it like? It's good. Yeah. It's not as good as the first one. Less pleasure. Then 10 minutes later, you arrive at your home and there's your young niece or nephew, four years old, cutest thing you've ever seen in your life. And she walks up to you and says, I brought you a mango. And once again, you haven't got the heart to say, look, I just had two mangoes. So what do you do? You take it and you eat it. Less pleasure. Keep going. Keep going. At some point, you get zero pleasure out of the mango. Every object that we can contact has this quality. Reducing return. The diminishing return on the investment of eating or contacting in whichever way. That's the first aspect of neutralization, that after a period of time we gain no further pleasure, but that's not the worst of it. The worst of it is that because we have allowed the mind to continue this process of demanding and getting whatever it asks for, it's developed a dependency. And so what we find is that the person is gaining no more satisfaction from the object, but they are still contacting it. Why? Okay, man mango isn't the best example. I'll give you a really good example. A friend of mine, is again, university years ago, was a chain smoker. He's no longer a smoker, I am pleased to say, but one time I asked him, he'd finished a cigarette like five minutes earlier, and he lit up another one. And I said to him, are you enjoying that cigarette? Could you just finished one? And he looked at it. No, not really. So why is he contacting a cigarette if he's not getting any pleasure out of it? Habitual dependency. Habitual dependency, which is another way of saying what? What happens if he doesn't smoke it? Withdrawal. Withdrawal. He's agitated. So the non-smoker is always at zero when it comes to cigarettes, right? Then he starts to smoke and gets a little bit of positive pleasure out of it and then drops back to zero. But the one who's addicted to smoking gets that zero pleasure when he contacts it, and then when he stops contacting, what happens? He drops below zero. Pain, suffering, withdrawal. And so to get himself back up to zero, he has to have constant supply of cigarettes. A habit to satisfy an ever present need. Cigarettes, alcohol, our children. We can become addicted to our children. That relationship, that contact to our spouses. We gain no further pleasure out of living with our spouse because it's such a habitual contact. But the thought that our spouse would leave us and be with somebody else or even spend a month in a foreign country, on, a, on our own in a, on a holiday, take your phone, yeah? Make sure you call me when you get to the airport and when you get to the hotel. The thought of being apart creates displeasure. This is addiction. And when the mind has become so strong in this way, what it means is that the mind will determine not just the choice to contact or not, but I know people who have been, who are or were addicted to opiates and they choose where they live based upon whether or not they are close to a heroin supplier. They chose a place to live because they know it's close to that person I know who has a good supply. They choose their friends, they choose their jobs, they choose everything only based around the addiction. If I've got it, I get no pleasure. If I don't have it, I get displeasure and it totally dictates all of these aspects of my life now. Where has this come from? It's come from the fact that the mind alone has been given everything it has asked for whenever it wanted it. Now, we would never treat our children this way, or at least we ought not to treat our children this way, to give them everything they ask for whenever they ask for it. Why do we treat our own minds this way? Because we don't know any better. We haven't been taught this. 
and we haven't practiced it. And so, coming back to your original question, what do we do if we get ourselves into this state? The way to get out of it is primarily through knowledge, but in terms of a practice. Let's look also at the way that we can ensure that this does not happen. Let's say you're not yet addicted to mangoes, or cigarettes even, or alcohol. Alcohol is a good example because you can have a healthy relationship with alcohol. If you're not yet addicted to alcohol, then what's the way to make sure you don't get addicted? Addicted. Well, you can drink alcohol and not become addicted. Moderation. Moderation. What is moderation? Well, the urge is not strong enough, and my intellect is stronger to suppress it. That's right. So the word suppress we would not normally use because that has negative connotations, but you've basically got it. Let's go back to the earlier example. If addiction arises because the mind alone chooses to contact, then moderation is when the intellect makes the choice to either contact it or not. So if the intellect makes the choice to contact, you are practicing moderation. If your intellect makes the choice to not contact, you are also practicing moderation. So moderation and regulation is not saying no. Moderation and regulation is saying yes, but the intellect saying yes and not the mind. So when we suppress, what that means is that we inhibit the mind's demand without proper understanding. And what's the effect of suppression? It'll rise again, stronger worse and occasionally often in a pathological way so a great example of this is in the realm of religion and spirituality where a person believes a highly spiritual a highly religious person doesn't have sexual contact and so when the natural urge arises what happens suppress it suppress it again and again and again and it pathologizes and it becomes something corrupt and then it expresses itself in ways that are unhealthy. So the way out of addiction is the same way to make sure we don't get into it in the first place is practice moderation, which means the intellect asks all of these questions. What is an appropriate level of contact? What is healthy contact with drugs, alcohol, sex, food, money, my wife, my kids, everything. The intellect decides, not anybody else, not society. I mean, you have to take society into consideration, for example, but you decide for yourself, taking into consideration all the different factors. So if we find ourselves getting towards addiction or towards neutralization, then we can recognize, okay, I'm in danger. I've got to reduce my contact to something that I believe is healthy, but the essence of it is that the it is that the intellect is deciding and not the mind who's in charge who's in charge that's the, that's the ultimate question mind or intellect and if you, and, you know, use the example that we we're discussing earlier if you put your children in charge of the household you can expect chaos if you put an adult in charge of the household you can expect relatively order if you put your mind in charge of your life, you can expect chaos internally, mental agitation, frustration, wrong relationships, addiction. If you put the adult, the intellect in charge, you can expect relative order, well-being, peace, happiness. Do you risk the chance of, of uh, removing chances of having any fun or pleasure? No, not at all. It's only when you allow the intellect to, di to dictate things that you can experience pleasure. The point is that the intellect, in fact, there's a good example, because somebody asked me once, because we were discussing this, and he said, so what about spontaneity? What about just doing things for no reason because they're fun? He said, the intellect knows that this is a healthy part of human life. And he, in fact, he gave an example. I'm at a party, and I decided to jump in the pool fully clothed. 
So if I use my intellect, I'm never going to do this? No. What's my nature? My nature is to be this sort of person. What do I think fun is? I think fun is doing something crazy like this. So the intellect has a clear understanding that there's nothing wrong with this. The mind has an impulse to do it. The intellect says, yeah, go for it. So you get the emotional enjoyment out of it, but you also get another level of enjoyment that is otherwise not there, which is the intellect's sanctioning. When your intellect knows that you're doing something that is okay, that is appropriate, that is healthy, even if it's something as seemingly crazy as jumping into the pool fully clothed, there is another dimension of enjoyment that is otherwise missing. It's more subtle. It's harder to grasp, but I'll give you an example. Let's say that your teenager comes home from school and you know she's got a geography test to study for tomorrow. But instead of studying, she throws the bag down and goes to Netflix and watches a movie. She enjoys the movie. Now, you know that she knows she's got the test. She's enjoying the movie, right? But all the while she knows, okay, I've got to study for my test later on. Fine, fine. That's fine. I'll just watch the movie. Now imagine she comes home. Different scenario. She goes towards Netflix and then suddenly says, yeah, I've got that test tomorrow. Hang on. Goes to the books, goes through the chapter, studies everything, and then goes and watches Netflix. What's the enjoyment of the movie like in the second scenario? It's not just the pure enjoyment of the visual and the entertainment of the movie. There is another dimension added now, which is that I've done my obligations, got nothing else pending, I can really sit and relax. It's now appropriate for me to just chill out in front of the movie. That has been added, whereas in the earlier example, that was absent. Probably a nagging guilt in the first example. Nagging guilt, or even if it's not guilt, it's just that the absence of something. It's the absence of that thought of, I am free now to make this choice. I know I am free because I've done everything else I need to do, no other pending work. And so when the intellect knows that this is appropriate, go for it. There's nothing wrong with anything in life. You want to do something spontaneous and fun for the pure sake of it? Go ahead. But don't choose the sweet if you're a diabetic for the pure fun of it because you know that what I pay for now, or sorry, what I, you know that what I enjoy now I'm going to have to pay for later and it's not going to be worth it. And so you give yourself maximum enjoyment all through life when you have this recognition. Okay, any other questions on anything before we conclude?